Hello and welcome to the Westminster Institute. I'm Robert Riley, its director. Today we have a special guest, Dr. Nicholas Eberstadt, who holds the Henry Wendt Chair in Political Economy at the American Enterprise Institute, where he researches and writes extensively on demographics and economic development generally, and more specifically on international security in the Korean Peninsula and Asia. Dr. Eberstadt is also a senior advisor at the National Bureau of Asian Research. His many books and monographs include Poverty in China, The Tyranny of Numbers, The End of North Korea, and Russia's Peacetime Demographic Crisis. His latest book is Men Without Work, America's Invisible Crisis. Dr. Eberstadt has testified numerous times uh, before the U.S. Congress and has served as a consultant or advisor for various elements in the United States government. He has a Ph.D. in political economy and government, an MPA from the Kennedy School of Government, and an A.B. from Harvard University. In addition, he holds a Master's of Science from the London School of Economics Today we're going to be discussing the problem of North Korea with the enticing title, One Kim to Rule Them All. Nick, welcome. Thank you so much, Bob. And thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me and for uh, risking the time uh, for this presentation. North Korea, uh, formerly the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, often known as DPRK, is what we might call a small country far away about which we know little, a phrase which was faithfully used in an earlier time. Um, you may know little about North Korea and you may not be interested in North Korea, but to paraphrase Leon Trotsky, North Korea is interested in you. And the DPRK is interested in the United States because it is planning to have a nuclear showdown with our government and with our country. It is planning to point a nuclear pistol at our heads. And it is working as assiduously as it can to develop the capabilities to bring about a crisis in which it will face and face down the United States in a nuclear contest in the Korean Peninsula. That is preparing to fight and to prevail in a nuclear showdown or show off in uh, in Korea. Uh, that's a big claim to make, and I've chosen my words carefully, and I'll try to back up what I've just said to you with a little bit of evidence and analysis in the next few minutes. The DPRK in North Korea um, was founded um, in the end of, uh, at the end of World War II, out of a fateful division of the Korean Peninsula that occurred at the time of the Japanese surrender. It was only supposed to be a temporary division of the two, uh, of the two parts of a uh, single country, a place that had been uh, a homogeneous uh, entity, actually, they called themselves an empire, for hundreds of years before that. Um, the U.S. State Department uh, was given the assignment of drawing a temporary line of partition, so there'd be a northern and a southern zone to the Korean Peninsula, where the victorious U.S. forces and the victorious Soviet forces would temporarily process surrendering Japanese imperial troops as had been conquered by Imperial Japan, who was one of their possessions. Uh, but as fate would have it, 
we moved into a Cold War rather than a happy peace after 1945. And these two uh, supposedly temporary uh, zones of processing became states. Uh, one state uh, in the south, obviously, was the, uh, is, is the Republic of Korea, which is now a uh, prosperous and flourishing economy, an affluent society, and a constitutional democracy. Also, for reasons we'll get into, a treaty ally of the United States with a military uh, defense pact. Um, north of this uh, processing line, known as the DMZ demarcation line, uh, demilitarized zone, uh, is the place that became the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Originally a, uh, a Stalin-era Soviet satellite, in 1948 established as a separate, independent, Stalin-style state the northern half of the peninsula. Um, <clears throat> the story of North Korea cannot be disentangled from the story of the Kim family of Pyongyang. There have been three generations of rulers in the, this Kim family uh, to date in North Korea, and the first of these, the founder of the Stalin-style dynasty, was Kim Il-sung, uh, nom de guerre. He made it very clear very early on that the division of the Korean peninsula was unnatural. This was, in effect, a civil war between contesting parties. And he wanted to solve the civil war by a unification of the peninsula. And he had a very, uh, very clear idea of how to solve the unification problem and how to unite the peninsula. And we uh, got more of an inkling of what he had in mind in June of 1950 when a surprise attack by North Korean forces swept across the uh, line of demarcation and began uh, what turned into a three-year global uh, global conflict known as the Korean War. It could have been a very short campaign if the United States had not intervened, but the United States uh, did intervene um, you know, to support the, uh, the South, and uh, one thing led to another, uh, by, uh, by 1951 and 52, uh, there were more than a, troops from more than a dozen countries, uh, besides the U.S. and the ROK, fighting on the side of the South Korean forces. Um, and in the North, Mao's um, People's Volunteer Army uh, was poor, had poured in hundreds of thousands of troops. Uh, the Soviet Union claimed to have stayed out of this conflict, uh, but we now know was secretly and surreptitiously sending um, um, jet fighters and others to uh, to their uh, to their aid. Um, the, uh, the war dragged on for years and years and was finally settled in 1953. Um, it was settled uh, after Stalin died. Stalin liked the bleeding of the U.S. and of, uh, of uh, the uh, Red Chinese forces. And it was settled because uh, Dwight Eisenhower became president. And let it be known that if the ceasefire did not come in, into force, he was planning to use atomic weapons to, um, to bring some clarity to the situation. Very quickly after that, a ceasefire was established. Among other things, this deeply impressed upon the North Korean side the tremendous importance of nuclear weapons 
in great power politics. Now, the North Korean side never gave up its claim for uniting all of the Korean population under the rule of the DPRK, or more specifically, under the rule of the Kim family. That's why we say one Kim to rule them all. And as the, uh, as the post-Korean War era uh, unfolded, the North Korean state began to depart from its Stalinist original uh, stamp to gain its own special characteristics. They were all based upon the original Stalin-style state. We've got to be very clear about that. But a Stalin-style state with Kim family characteristics is a regime that has, if this is imaginable, an even more totalitarian claim and grasp on its people, and a arguably more durable base for maintaining its power and its continuity. So, um, why do I say that? Uh, well, we know the basic schema of a Stalin-style state. It's got a party, it's got a vanguard Marxist-Leninist party or an elite party. Uh, it has gulags, uh, it has secret police, um, and the uh, apparatus for monopoly of violence and for inflicting terror upon the population to control. Um, the Kim family uh, took that uh, original model and they improved upon it. So whereas the, uh, let's say, the Stalin-style state would have one secret police, one KGB, um, the North Korean uh, government decided it was good to have many of them, to have a number of competing secret police forces, uh, which would not just surveil the population, but also surveil each other and report up to the leader. Uh, is one of the important reasons helping to explain why two generations of dictators, of supreme dictators, died safely in their own beds. We're now on dictator number three, Kim Jong-un. Uh, another uh, variation in the North Korean model uh, had to do with how terror would be inflicted. Uh, in the Stalin-style terror, people would be taken away from their families in the middle of the night, and we know all about that, and read and heard about all those tragedies, and those crimes against uh, people and against humanity. Um, the North Korean approach to terror was terror with family values. It was informed by Confucianist notions. So if one were in the crosshairs of the North Korean terror machine, it wasn't just you would be put into their North Korean style gulag, be your family. It would, uh, if you were at risk, then your wife and your children were at risk, your parents were at risk, your cousins were at risk. Uh, and the th threat of um, of exposing one's family and loved ones to uh, state terror turned out to be a very effective threat indeed. It helps to explain why so very few defectors have left this awful police state, um, because they know that if they go and they don't bring their whole family, they've got a very good idea of what's going to happen to the family. A third uh, differentiation from the, uh, from the Stalinist original had to do with the evolving ideology of the North <clears throat> Korean state. Uh, Marxism, Leninism is, uh, was good while it uh, lasted and it keeps on making recurrent eruptions throughout history. We can't go for very long uh, in the 20th or 21st century without a a uh, new, uh, often unexposed cohort uh, discovering this uh, 
toxin, this ideal, whatever you want to call it. But um, when we, as we saw from the collapse of the, uh, of the Soviet Union and from the collapse of the Soviet satellites, um, the, the drawing and staying power of the uh, somewhat intellectualized ideology of um, historical determinism and class struggle you know, uh, has its limits. North Korea pulled a sort of a switch with its ideology. It started out with uh, Marx and Lenin and Engels and Stalin in the classrooms and in, uh, in the public squares. They got rid of them. And instead it just had Kim family members. Kim number one, Kim Il-sung, Kim number two, Kim Jong-il, now of course the third one, Kim Jong-un. It switched from, uh, it switched from uh, a sort of a bureaucratic socialist model to an imperial dynastic model, which would have been obviously anathema to Lenin or even to Mao. Um, and there's a lot more staying power, it seems, in this sort of quasi-monarchical uh, way of organizing a society and organizing a polity. And they, they made their polity one uh, which increasingly emphasized racialism and the racial destiny of the Korean people. They called it uh, Juche thought. Uh, and Juche thought uh, actually is fairly coherent. We, uh, it, it, it can be, uh, it can be uh, a little bit tedious to read, but there is, a, uh, there is a coherence and a logic to it. And to spare you from having to go through these volumes and through all the propaganda, give you the elevator version. Um, the elevator version holds that the Korean race, and let's call it what they say it is, a minjok, a race of people. The Korean race has been abused since the beginning of history by big powers that have exploited it. And you know who the big powers are, China, Japan, uh, now the United States of America. And the Kim family, especially the first uh, family, the first leader of the DPRK, Kim Il-sung, let us call him the Moses of this movement, was brought North Korea's population into a safe haven, a promised land, uh, where the people were protected against the abuses and depredations of the evil races that were always uh, exploiting Korea. But the struggle is only half over because only half of the Korean race lives under the benevolent care of the Kims of Pyongyang. And the unfilled revolution, the unfilled mission of the Korean people is to reunite, to throw off the oppressors of the oppressed half of the Korean race, and at last to have a paradise where all Koreans can live independently in a socialist, paradise uh, supervised by the DPRK and, of course, by the Kims of Pyongyang. This is the ideology, and um, it may not sound very appealing to you, dear listener, but if we use history as any guide, uh, nationalism, the hum of racialism, uh, the, raci the hum of racialism, the draw of racialism to um, a moat and to move people and to risk their lives has been pretty powerful. We saw that in the 19th century, we saw that in the 20th century. We may be a little bit tone deaf about this ourselves now, but I can assure you that there are a lot of people in Asia who are not yet tone deaf to the hum of nationalism. Now the the phrase national socialism has already been dibs by somebody else in the last century, so I don't think we can call the North Korean system 
uh, national socialism. Or why wouldn't we call it racial socialism? So this police state using Stalin-style techniques, improving upon them, to build a um, racial socialist um, uh, apparatus uh, had an unconditional objective of absorbing the South Korean population on its own terms. There's no room for compromise in the North Korean view, of North Korean official view of unification because compromise would, compromise would be evil. Compromise would leave part of the Korean race under the oppressive control or the bayonets of the imperialists in the South. Uh, and if the North Korean regime were to accede to this, were to agree, well, um, uh, we'll have some coexistence here indefinitely, that would also undermine the North's own legitimacy and authority. Because remember, the North Korean government has demanded extraordinary sacrifices and hardships from its own population. Not just the huge slaughter that came from the Korean War, but the sacrifices in what they called the building of socialism. Uh, more recently, the, in the 1990s, the terrible North Korean famine the only famine ever, by the way, to befall a literate, urbanized population in peacetime. Uh, none of those sacrifices could be justified if at the end of the day they say, we're going to live and let live somehow. Um, it would be subversive for, for the leadership themselves. So, so the leadership is um, bound, determined, and indeed impelled to pursue unconditional unification. Now, as we look at this, it's very much like uh, imagining that a shrimp is going to swallow a uh, swallow a whale. North Korea has got a smaller population, a much smaller population. Its economy, to put a round number on it, its GDP is approximately zero. Uh, it's an impoverished, uh, an impoverished society, as you said, pre not all too recently, an infamished uh, society, and not so much of a uh, international poster child for emulation. Whereas the South is affluent, it's risen from uh, from desperate poverty into the ranks of the aid-giving Western uh, societies. It's a technological innovator. Uh, we, we see all of this with our uh, LG phones and many other parts of our apparatuses in our daily life. Uh, it's a constitutional democracy and has been for more than a generation. Um, the idea that small impoverished country could uh, defeat a large one may seem um, outlandish to us. But it does not seem outlandish to the North Korean leadership because they believe that they have an ideology which makes them pure and righteous and the other side corrupt and uh, rotten and pampered and spoiled. And they also believe that the other side has no will to fight. Now, because of the tremendous um, divergence in economic fortunes between the two Koreas over the course of the post-war period. The North has, has lost the option of uh, a conventional, a second conventional war against the South. The North simply does not have the resources or the prospect of being able to defeat the uh, the army of uh, the Republic of Korea, a modernized, modern army, uh, on, in a conventional war. Um, and as I mentioned already, their ideology isn't a great, 
uh, isn't a great amount of isn't a great uh, piece of salesmanship for most people who live in an open society. So instead, the North Korean government has been pushing along the only avenue where it believes that it can uh, gain an advantage, and this is in nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons, ballistic missiles, and the like. For over 30 years, the North Korean government has been attempting to perfect long-range as well as short-range and intermediate-range ballistic missiles uh, that can deliver uh, not just uh, a regular atomic weaponry, but hydrogen bombs, you know, um, thermonuclear weapons, uh, not just locally in the Korean Peninsula or more regionally in Japan, but all the way to the United States of America. Why is that? Because the North Korean government is very much aware that the U.S. is South Korea's nuclear protector. Through the military alliance that emerged after, that was forged after the ceasefire, <coughs> the United States have, is committed to protecting the ROK from foreign invasions that would be the North in the first instance. Uh, the North Korean regime believes that through psychological warfare and through other uh, irregular methods of uh, competition, that they would have a uh, fair chance, as I mentioned uh, already, of taking on South Korea mano a mano if the United States were not involved. And the logic of developing a long-range nuclear capability is the logic of attempting to threaten the United States so that the U.S. will break its treaty commitments with the ROK and exit from the Korean Peninsula, bring out its troops, end its nuclear umbrella. So how does this fanciful idea, um, how is this fanciful idea supposed to work? Well, I'll give you just one of many different possible scenarios uh, to give you an example of the way that this might be thought through. Um, let's say the North Korean government um, creates a provocation back up north. Let's say they pretend that they were bombed or attacked, have footage to suggest this to the international uh, media, and they say that uh, um, matching words with words and actions with actions, we the North Koreans are going to take a limited uh, retaliation against the South. And they uh, deliver a barrage of uh, artillery against an American base somewhere in the south, or rockets against an American base, kill many people there, including many South Koreans. South Korea is a very cosmopolitan country now, maybe they'd kill many people from other countries as well. What happens then in the U.S. Uh, ROK military alliance? Uh, an American president might have to make a decision. Do we respond and escalate and risk a general war in the Korean Peninsula, a war that the Allies would surely win, but maybe at a fearful cost? Or do we hesitate and try to um, off-ramp, cool things down, talk things out, uh, which might seem very much to be the responsible thing to do? That might be the responsible thing to do, but it might also be something that would uh, suggest that the alliance has no credibility, whatever. And once an alliance has no credibility under such circumstances, its uh, lifespan becomes very short. Um, there are many other sorts of scenarios like this that one can imagine in which the North Korean government 
would bring about a crisis that would draw the two sides to the brink of what could be a nuclear war, but might not even have uh, many shots fired. Uh, ideally, it would be a sort of a Sun Tzu thing where uh, win a victory without, uh, without many arrows being, uh, being uh, launched. And um, with no intention of actually seeing an exchange of nuclear weapons. So, so that would be a way of uh, preparing to fight and win a nuclear confrontation in the Korean Peninsula against the United States, despite the U.S. absolute preponderance of forces. Um, so, for 30 years, the North Korean side has been um, methodically uh, preparing its nuclear arsenals and its delivery systems uh, to for the day when it can. North Korean strategy would hope it can uh, choose a place and a time to devise the crisis which would help to break the alliance. Um, there are of course other ways of uh, attempting to break the alliance and um, in the last several years uh, we've seen um, We've seen North, the North Korean side encourage some of these uh, less militaristic approaches. Um, one of these is the um, end of war declaration, is the notion that um, some of the contestants in the Korean War would declare a peace to have occurred. The, the Korean War is over, we are now um, in a post-Korean uh, War era, uh, and uh, the possibilities of detente uh, are really quite uh, 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 quite and enthusing. Uh, the the North Korean side has encouraged the idea of a uh, end of war declaration for years uh, because they, uh, they have hoped that this would provide a sort of a logical basis uh, for the argument that there is no need for U.S. troops, U.S. military guarantees, or a U.S. ROK alliance with the South. Um, and the, uh, the current government of the ROK seems to be quite enthused by this notion of, a, uh, of an end of a war declaration and has been trying to encourage a uh, U.S. ally to engage in this. Uh, so far the United States has politely um, deferred from this. Um, but it's clearly something which the North Korean side would like to use as an instrument to dislodge, to help dislodge the United States from the Korean Peninsula. This brings us more or less up to where we are now. The North Korean government has been less aggressive and less menacing uh, in the last two years in, let us call it, the era uh, than previously. Um, why has the North Korean government been so quiet? Um, I can't tell you for certain. Uh, I haven't had that chat with Kim Jong-un myself. Um, but my hypothesis is this. Um, with the threat, and the lockdowns that were forcefully implemented to protect most critically the Supreme Leader, Kim Jong-un, um, North Korea's economy and society uh, have been under severe strain. Uh, and the North Korean economy has uh, lost uh, a great deal of its capabilities. 
losing it's losing economic capabilities in the self-imposed lockdown is a much more severe lockdown than the sanctioned uh, impact that the international community attempted to impose uh, in, uh, in the consequence of North Korea's missile and nuclear threats. Um, this, um, this ongoing economic uh, self-imposed crisis has re reduced the state's capability to pursue many different ambitions, including maybe possibly, maybe perhaps, its, um, its WMD missile and nuke programs. Over the last two years, we saw um, what might look like a sort of a forbearance on the DPRK's part when it came to nuclear and missile testing. The main weapon that was used internationally by the North Korean regime uh, during this period was the uh, first sister's loud mouth, Kim Jong, uh, Kim Jong Un's sister, uh, had quite a bit of sharp uh, propaganda to uh, inflict upon uh, uh, people in the South and people in the U.S. and elsewhere, but uh, you know, unlike sticks and stones, uh, words can't really hurt you. Uh, we're starting to see now, in early 2022, what may possibly turn out to be a resumption of North Korean missile testing. Uh, the begin in the first two months of this year, we had a number of short-range uh, ballistic missile tests. Then we had a intermediate range ballistic missile test in February. Um, we can't tell yet what this means. Uh, one possible uh, portent we may have uh, in front of us is we may be seeing signs that the North Korean economy uh, is recovering from the crisis and that the North Korean state is no longer entirely overwhelmed by this domestic crisis and is getting back onto its feet. If the North Korean state is getting back onto its feet, um, I think we should be prepared to expect the familiar North Korean state international um, menace playbook to resume. More testing of ballistic missiles, more testing of nuclear weapons and more nuclear diplomacy, North Korea style, which means using these capabilities to threaten the international community, to threaten South Korea, and to threaten the United States. Um, thank you for your attention. It's been a pleasure to have a chance to share some of my thoughts and analysis with you. Nick, thank you very much for that comprehensive overview of North Korea and what animates the Kim regime. <clears throat> can, can we discuss, uh, aside from talking about what you have so far, what are the demographics of North Korea? That's a situation which you have paid some close attention to, as well as South Korea. Um, the, the North Korean government uh, uh, operates uh, as maybe the world's uh, best practitioner of strategic deception. Uh, so the strategic deception that I first that I mentioned initially was about uh, the launch of the Korean War uh, back in the uh, back in June of 1950, the North Korean government was treating South Korean counterparts to a, uh, uh, to a roundtable conference where they were supposed to hash out their differences, but instead launched a surprise attack. Um, North Korean government, uh, in a much more pedestrian way, um, uses strategic deception with regard to information to misinform or blind outsiders um, about its own strengths and weaknesses and intentions and strategies. Um, so all information for the DPRK government is a weapon. And that is one of the reasons that the North Korean regime has never ever published a statistical yearbook. 
It's been in power since 1948, and there's not once been a, a statistical, uh, statistical yearbook uh, published. Um, North Korea's population situation is a matter of considerable uncertainty, given this approach to uh, um, quantitative facts. Back in the 19, late 1980s, the North Korean government gave some few tidbits about, um, about its demographic situation to the United Nations Population Fund because they wanted some technical assistance to help with the census. They haven't taken a census for the first uh, 40 plus years of their uh, state existence. Um, on the basis of that information, uh, some of us did a reconstruction of North Korea's population situation. And um, we were able to see that uh, up to that point, uh, demographic trends in the South and the North in the post-Korean War era were fairly similar. Uh, educational uh, progress, uh, declining birth rates, improving health levels. Remember, this is all before the famine. Uh, because the North Korean government had no demographers when they gave these numbers to the, uh, to the United Nations, they didn't realize that they were accidentally revealing the size of their armed forces. Uh, up, through, uh, up until 1970, their numbers showed total civilian population from 1970 till the end of the 1980s, their numbers showed only civilian population. Well, if you knew what you were doing, you could reconstruct total population, subtract civilian, and guess what you had? Um, we were able to we were able to show that the North Korean armed forces, as indicated or implied by North Korean uh, statistics, uh, was grown very very substantially in size from the 1970s through the 1980s up towards the end of the Cold War period, and needless to say. My North Korean friends weren't terribly happy about that. One of the things that North Korean officials, I think, learned from that experience was that population numbers weren't just uh, dry as dust and irrelevant. Population numbers were political, just like economic figures were political, and they themselves had to improve them. And so, uh, in the period since that, uh, release of information to the UN, the North Korean government has held, uh, conducted, and released two censuses. They're full of inconsistencies and um, odd you know, quirks. And the easiest way to explain the quirks, this may not be the correct way of explaining them, but the easiest way of explaining them is to suggest that the first census the North Korean government was trying to hide the military, and in the second census, the North Korean government was trying to hide the famine. Uh, the, la the most recent census was held in 2008, and they have not held one since then. I can't tell you why they have not. I can tell you that the more information you release to the outside world, the more difficult it is to falsify the demographic situation. Well, the, the standard uh, number that's usually given for the size of the North Korean military is a million. Does that still obtain? It's, it's very hard for someone like me to, uh, to verify that. Since I have, I've got no security clearances, and I deal with open source information. Um, the, last, uh, the last information that I could use, you know, um, use myself uh, and try to reconstruct was for the 1980s, and by that time, the, uh, our own reconstructions for the late 1980s suggested that a million, and a, just about a million and a quarter persons were in the uh, non-civilian population. It's basically back in the nineteen in the late nineteen eighties. That would have been the equivalent of kind of USA nineteen forty three. It would have not not forty four, but uh, a total war society that was on a military uh, footing. Uh, there isn't a lot of uh, there isn't a lot of evidence to suggest that the North Korean military has demobilized since then. So it seems it's 
It's quite possible that the North Korean government has the third or fourth largest military force in the world now. You, you seem to discount the, uh, the pursuit of a conventional war as a means to achieve, achieve the objective of unification. Uh, I remember some time ago <clears throat> reading the statistics concerning North Korean artillery in their, their caves and bunkers, which if used, uh, could take out Seoul within the space of an hour. Now, I don't know what their objective would be, the political objective in completely destroying Seoul, which is the main population center of the South. But um, as in the Soviet case in the Cold War, they were building nuclear forces yes. to uh, deter U.S. nuclear forces and uh, allow them to enjoy the conventional military superiority yes. they had over NATO countries yes. and, and obviously then use the political leverage that gave them. Is there any, sure. is there any analogous situation Absolutely. here? So um, we, got a, we got a clue about, what, about the North Korean uh, objectives and strategy uh, in, as, let's say, a spontaneous civilian uprising in the South uh, from the Rangoon bombings in 1983. And uh, those with long memories may recall that then military strongman running uh, South Korea, this is before the democratic era, um, Chung Kwan visited uh, Myanmar, Burma, and uh, at a, a shrine, oh, most, uh, much of his cabinet and many people with him were killed by, um, by a terror bomb. It missed him. Uh, this bomb was, uh, was set by North Korean agents to destroy the entire leadership of the South Korean government at that point. That was not the only thing which was part of this same plan. Uh, at, the, at the same time, uh, a little uh, less known uh, incident was North Korean frogmen caught off of the shore of the southern city of Pusan in South Korea. It turned out that those frogmen were supposed to blow up City Hall. Why blow up City Hall? because all of this was supposed to be a spontaneous South Korean insurrection against the South, against the South Korean puppets and uh, who were being uh, supported by the bayonets of the imperialists and to lead to an uprising in the South. Um, the, the actual objective there might not have been to uh, to see demonstrations in favor of Kim Il-sung in the streets. I'm sure they really thought that was going to happen. But to create a sort of chaos and a plausible fog of war in which there'd be a paralysis in the South and the North Korean, the enormous North Korean forces could come in really kind of unopposed. Uh, and that sort of a that sort of a scenario or a game plan uh, may still be very much in the minds of North Korean leadership. Uh, get the United States out, uh, encourage, uh, encourage something that will be like a chaos in the South, and with chaos or paralysis, we can come in more or less unopposed with large forces and take what's ours. In the dire straits in which North Korea has found itself uh, during and the repeated famines it's undergone, uh, the failure to really employ any market reforms that would increase productivity, it would seem that the only way that they're able to sustain this modern ICBM uh, nuclear weapons development is with the aid of China. And that North Korea is only so big a problem as China allows it to be because it, after all, is the whale in the neighborhood and North Korea is the shrimp. Um, and and it, I might also ask you to comment, does the problem that North Korea presents, uh, 
it, it certainly complicates the situation for the United States, Japan, and our allies. Uh, and exacerbating that problem uh, it allows China a, a certain uh, plausible deniability. Yeah. Well, is, do you think that's is what go? I mean, I was rather stunned when I was in China uh, as a guest of the Central Committee for Foreign Affairs uh, section that someone had a well, Chinese official had the temerity to say we can do nothing about North Korea that's your you you're the ones who need to do that yeah. <laughs> yeah, <sure. laughs> yeah. well so my impression is that there's no love lost between the Chinese and the North Korean leadership and they actually detest each other uh, but because uh, the 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 North Korean uh, leadership, first of all, has this racial animosity towards great power. It's got a, a deep historical resentment of the way that uh, pre-communist uh, imperial China degraded uh, and um, exploited the, uh, the Korean population in the tributary system. One of the uh, one of the worst political words that you can use is translated as a flunkyism, but that's a kind of a weird translation of the old imperial uh, tributary ideology. So it's being a you know being a servant of the great, um, and there's plenty of uh, there's plenty of reasons for resentment as well in more recent times. You, you can go back to the 1990s and see that the famine was actually triggered by a Chinese shutdown of, of, of drop-off of food supplies to the North. I mean, the, the North Korean policymakers were ultimately obviously responsible for this problem, but it was precipitated by a Chinese decision. And of course, on the Chinese side, I mean, think of what it would be like to live next to Joey Gallo in the next apartment, except that Joey Gallo has nuclear weapons. I mean, they've got, there's plenty of uh, there's plenty of reason for animosity, and they both say pretty um, nasty things about each other off the record, and sometimes it even gets into the into the press. But that being said. They have a long border, and they have to have some sort of a modus uh, vivendi. And from the Chinese standpoint, the modus of vivendi, or the logic, seems to be, as best as I can understand it, since the uh, authorities in Beijing are almost entirely opaque about this, as long as the North Korean side causes more trouble for the U.S. and the Western alliance than it causes for China, it's okay. Now, it's a sort of an odd calculation because uh, that's, uh, that's a dog that uh, isn't biting me right now, but it's a nuclear-armed state that's right on the border. And back in the, 19, um, back in the 1960s, uh, there actually were little military shootouts along the border between the uh, Cultural Revolution China and the North Korean side. Um, my my guess would be, it's only a guess, my guess would be that the Chinese leadership is a little bit afraid of North Korea. Um, strange as that might sound. Um, the North Korean, the North Korean uh, economic aid leash from China has, gets longer or shorter, it seems, at different periods of time, but the North Koreans are Koreans. Remember, they are, you know, at the end of the day, Koreans. They're smart, enterprising people. Their government uh, operates under uh, very different uh, strictures and objectives from anything that we're uh, immediately familiar with. But the North Korean government is always trying out new means of funding itself. Um, those means don't usually include uh, attempts at economic reform, since that's, uh, they've seen how that ends in other parts of the world, uh, although they have had limited, uh, limited forays with pragmatism uh, that haven't worked so badly. But they've been very inventive overseas in finding new sources of funds from, let's say, friends in Iran, from having a homework club together, let's say. Um, 
North Korean governments become uh, quite adept, we hear at uh, cyber fraud. Uh, before it was adept at cyber fraud, became uh, quite inventive in insurance fraud in the city of London. But nothing ever rests. There's always activity and churning and, uh, if you wish to look at it this way, a certain sort of brilliant enterprise that's, uh, uh, that's empowering the state. But if, if China chose to cut off uh, the energy supplies and the food that it gives to North Korea, uh, it, it would, that would be catastrophic for North Korea, or am I overstating that? It, it would be it would be pretty severe. It would be pretty severe. Um, one thing, however, to recognize is that the North Korean government has been absolutely brilliant at catching aid from the international community. Uh, back in back, they, they, there's a genius, a real inspired genius to their ability to take aid from other countries without um, surrendering their allegiance or affection. So back in the classical Cold War era, North Korea played Moscow against Beijing, getting aid from both and declaring allegiance to neither. Um, in the 1990s, when Chinese aid went down and Soviet aid, of course, had gone away altogether, the North Korean government succeeded in obtaining aid from, of all people, the South Korean government that they were sworn to destroy. And there was a sunshine policy which Japan and the USA joined. Uh, after that, we saw the, as I mentioned, the homework club with Iran and other sorts of um, illicit uh, activities in drugs and other things, providing resources. So I would tend to agree with you that a cutoff of existing Chinese supplies to the DPRK would be devastating now, but I just wouldn't rule out the possibility that this state, which seems to have nine lives, would land on its feet in a way that might surprise us in coming up with new sources of aid from abroad that we wouldn't have thought of. And the sources of technology that they're employing, for instance, uh, they, they said recently they were uh, testing cameras for the spy satellites they were launching with their missiles. Uh, very sophisticated stuff. Well, so... Which they don't have the ability to produce themselves, right? Well, uh, they've, they've borrowed, they've begged, borrowed, and stolen a lot of technology internationally. They've, um, they, their homework club has also included uh, scientists from the former uh, Soviet empire, of course. Um, and they've gotten a certain amount of, uh, they've gotten a certain amount of international um, assistance from, from technological, uh, from technological uh, cooperation, technical assistance with the outside world. I mean, do recall that um, there, there is, for example, a place in North Korea called the Pyongyang University of Science and Technology, which is a private Western funded uh, university where um, I, I think the, um, the reason for this or the, uh, the explanation of this is these are people of faith who are uh, hoping that they're going to be doing some sort of um, uh, evangelization in the DPRK, um, but that's been a um, that's been an aperture for not just uh, training in cyber, thus in cyber crime, but in other sorts of technological areas as well. Um, so the, the North Korean uh, the, the North Korean project is constantly looking for new sources that it can exploit internationally. Do you think that the North Koreans uh, seriously consider the use of the nuclear weapons that they have developed or 
they, they just want to develop them to the point uh, that they're, they're serious enough to enjoy the political leverage to break the alliance in the South. Well, because he, I mean, yeah. Kim Jong-un would know a nuclear war that yeah. his country would disappear. Um, so the, the circumstances under which, I mean, as a you know, distant observer from the outside, the the circumstances under which I can most easily imagine uh, North Korea detonating nuclear weapons against enemies would be one in which they were almost certain would elicit no response. They would, they would have to feel very confident that um, there would not be a retaliation against the DPRK for doing something like this. The, the North Korean government seems and is uh, tremendously aggressive in its posture against the South, in its posture against the United States, in other sorts of foreign internationally. But it's an aggressiveness that also has a certain caution and that conservatism isn't the right word, but it's prudence. Uh, prudence is a better word. Prudence. Uh, it uh, it makes usually small steps uh, to make sure that it can make gains and then consolidate them. When it takes big risks, it takes those big risks um, because it thinks that they're not. There's not going to be a big response. The surprise attack of 1950 is a perfect example of that. They thought they were going to be walking into South Korea. They thought it was. Uh, they thought that Dean Acheson had more or less said South Korea was outside of the U.S. security perimeter. Um, if uh, if the Americans had indicated that South Korea had been within the U.S. security per perimeter, it's much harder to imagine that that surprise attack would have taken place. So, this is to say that it may, be, it may be difficult for us to imagine a scenario in which a North Korean nuclear weapon would not meet a devastating reprisal. If the North Koreans can figure out a way where they would get to launch, a, uh, launch or detonate a nuke and not be punished for it, I think that would be their ideal scenario for use of this as opposed to a threat. I see. Now, as you know, there's going to be an election in South Korea for a new president. Uh, it, to what extent in the campaigning is this end of war declaration an issue, or is it? it usually, politics is pretty domestic in most democracies, and in South Korea, um, Elections probably have been settled mainly on domestic political issues rather than international political issues. I'm calling North Korea an international issue even though, uh, strictly speaking, this would be a divided country and uh, maybe a domestic issue. But um, the question of North Korea has come up in the, uh, in the current election and seems to be a a, one of the salient uh, issues that the two leading candidates are uh, are debating about. The one candidate being from the ruling uh, ruling party, which uh, embraces this so-called uh, general sunshine approach of reconciliation. They would call it appeasement. Their critics would call it. Um, the leading opposition uh, party is uh, is critiquing this, uh, arguing that it is um, at best uh, uh, fanciful and at worst uh, dangerous for the security of the South Korean citizens and um, raising big uncertainties about the future of the U.S. ROK uh, alliance. Um, South Korea is a very polarized country. It's, it, if you imagine this, it's an even more polarized country than the USA at the moment. And there are, there are 
people were very strongly in favor of the sunshine reconciliation appeasement approach and others uh, who were very, very skeptical of this and think that a, um, a more traditional uh, deterrence approach is necessary to protect against the DPRK. Well, these recent launches about which you spoke, uh, Nick, uh, certainly have gotten the attention of Japan, South Korea, and the United States. And it occasioned a meeting of our Secretary of State, uh, Blinken, and the foreign secretaries of, of both Japan yeah. and Korea together. Uh, and, and before Blinken joined the meeting, apparently those two uh, foreign affairs ministers uh, spent some time together. And I, that's, of course, a, a, a very hot button uh, relationship between Japan and South Korea because of the history of Japanese occupation. And uh, but but it seemed uh, is it the case that the very threat that North Korea is presenting uh, may help overcome those resentments and bring a closer relationship between Japan and South Korea, which is necessary for their mutual defense. Well, this gets back to the whole question of uh, polarization in South Korean politics. At the risk of uh, way oversimplifying, we can see that there's something like a continuing civil war going on in an unfinished civil war in South Korean politics, too, with people who, uh, on one side, look at they call the conservatives as being the descendants of uh, they accuse of Japanese collaborators in the imperial era, and on the other side, the uh, people who would look at what they would call the progressives or the left wing, and they'd say that they're the um, uh, sympathizers and stooges of the communists and the oppressors in the north. I mean, these these arguments. Uh, these arguments can throw blood pretty quickly and get out of politeness pretty quickly. The, the North Korean government uh, likes to make the um, propaganda uh, accusation that the South Koreans will be the puppets or the uh, servants of the Japanese previous imperialists uh, and that um, there's no that there's no good reason for uh, Koreans of any sort, north or south, to be cooperating with these erstwhile oppressors, um, and there's uh, there's enough historical bitterness there, as you indicated, that they can sometimes uh, exacerbate uh, exacerbate uh, spats or uh, disputes that may be going on between uh, the the South and, uh, and Japan. Uh, my my guess is that uh, that the progressive side is a little bit more weary of um, of cooperation with Japan than the conservative side uh, in the upcoming you know as we look towards the future of this North Korean threat. Um, but we have to recognize that in both so-called uh, conservative and so-called progressive circles. Uh, in the South, that there's a very um, unproductive attitude towards looking at past past uh, injustices or events, incriminating about these, when a more forward-looking alliance would look at the threats that they face right now. Think of the difference between um, France and Germany after World War II, when they had plenty to be, French had plenty to be bitter about. Uh, and compare that to South Korea and Japan today. A lot of little squabbles as opposed to building statecraft for uh, security for a region. Uh, let me close with this question, Nick, if I may. Considering all the complexities that you've presented and the idea that the United States is now pivoting to Asia because of the threat that China presents, mm -hmm. our, our longstanding uh, defense agreement with South Korea uh, as well as our relationship with Japan, the repair of relationship to the Philippines, are, is the United? What do you think the United? How appraised the United States' current policy? The current within to South Korea, but within the context of, of yeah. our, our major concern in that area. 
Um, my impression is that at the moment the United States has an unusual age, uh, limited amount of bandwidth in dealing with international uh, troubles and challenges and problems. Um, and I would say that that, uh, that isn't so much because of the changing uh, straits of the USA or the changing capabilities of the USA, but I'd say it's growing pains of this uh, administration. Um, and uh, certainly the war against Ukraine is not increasing the bandwidth of the administration to deal with international problems. Um, with regard to Asia, thus far, the administration has focused um, not entirely, but very, very largely upon China questions and, and seems to be relieved uh, in deferring other problems to the future. Uh, the, um, the fact that DPRK was not in its familiar menacing shakedown uh, mode when the Biden administration took office was a, a sort of a relief, I think, for, uh, for policymakers because that was one less thing they have to deal with right now. And the administration was uh, sufficiently happy to put North Korea on the back burner that more or less took um, in the uh, U.S. Uh, ROK presidential summit uh, last year, they more or less took uh, the South Korean side's talking points and made them into a joint declaration. Um, that, that's fine. Uh, if you wish to defer a problem until it becomes unavoidable. My uh, worry is that North Korea wants to become unavoidable and will be unavoidable um, sooner or later. Great. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time now, and I should like to thank Dr. Nicholas Eberstadt at the American Enterprise Institute for speaking to us about the problem of North Korea and the one Kim to rule them all. I invite our viewers to go to the Westminster Institute website and our YouTube channel, and not only to watch this program, but the other programs that we have done on the Asian region, Japan, Taiwan, China, uh, as well as on the Ukraine-Russia problem that uh, Nick briefly mentioned. Uh, I'm Robert Riley, your host. Thank you for joining us today.